Aloha no and welcome to another Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Hard for many younger folks to believe, but within the lifetime of today's grandparents, many public school districts on the mainland were racially segregated. Whites in this school, blacks in that school. And when the highest court in the land declared in 1954 that public schools could no longer be segregated, well, some schools simply did not go along. Nine African-American teenagers showed courage and dignity in the face of angry mobs, which is why the University of Hawaii School of Social Work at Manoa invited Minnie Jean Brown Tricky of the Little Rock Nine to share stories with students, and why we invited her to share stories with us. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky is a teacher, a writer, a lecturer. And in 1957, she was a high school junior who wanted a better education than the one offered at the poorly funded all-black school where she would have gone if the U.S. Supreme Court hadn't opened the way for public school desegregation. She became one of the Little Rock Nine, nine young African-American students who enrolled in all-white Little Rock Central High in the state capital of Arkansas. I gotta say, I, I've always been fascinated by what happened in 1957, but I, it's hard for me to identify with it because we didn't have schools like that here and there was not angry mobs, national, 250 National Guard people at the, at the door of the school. Can you tell me what your life was like before you tried to enter the school? Well, I guess you didn't have to undo a situation such as blatant segregation in schools because you didn't have slavery. So I think, yeah, it might be difficult for a part of the country that hasn't had that experience to to really kind of come to grips with it. But basically, uh, imagine a place where a black person can't go to a hotel or water fountains were labeled colored and white, uh, restrooms were in different places and labeled colored and white, um, sh trying on shoes was in the back of the store. Uh, we, we weren't allowed or it was frowned upon trying on clothing in a clothing store. So, and we sat on the back of the bus. Um, somehow I thought, well, if I can go to school with teenagers who are like me, who are thoughtful, uh, intelligent, creative, some of this stuff will just go away because it won't make sense to them the same as it doesn't make sense to me. So it's, it's, it's kind of, a whole way of thinking and a whole way of life that was based on white supremacy and black inferiority, as simple as that. I didn't like it. At that young age, you were already real clear on that. I didn't like the conditions of segregation. They weren't pleasant. They um, devalued me. I was at risk for breaking the law because those facilities were the way they were by law. It was illegal to go to a circus and sit next to a white person, for goodness sakes, or not go to the circus at all. Um, South Pacific, I really wanted to go to that, but I couldn't go to that auditorium. Blacks could not go to that auditorium. Um, so you, it, it's about getting denied everything that's kind of fun or that's exciting or that you can uh, grow from or learn from. South Pacific by Rogers and Hammerstein. Interestingly, there's a line in the musical which says, racism is not born in you, it happens after you're born. And a song, you've got to be carefully taught. Today, Minnie Jean is doing the teaching and telling the story of the Little Rock Nine. In 1954, in a court case known as Brown versus the Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court declared racial segregation to be unconstitutional, yet some schools in the South remain segregated. When nine African-American students enrolled at Little Rock Central High, the governor defied the law of the land and sent in the Arkansas National Guard to keep out the black teens. 
President Dwight D. Eisenhower intervened and he deployed army troops to escort the students into the school. They were met with physical and verbal abuse, hostility and death threats, not just that day or week, but continuously for months. Minnie Jean Brown and eight other students became known as the Little Rock Nine. And their steadfastness changed the lives of every African American. Would you take us back to that day that you reported for your first day at Little Rock Central High School? Well, I'll, I'll go back further than that and say, in May of 1957, on the bulletin at the school, they announced, if you live in the Central District, and you want to go, sign up. And I did. Hmm. Said, you know, it's there. It's in my neighborhood. Why not? And two other girls, my best friend signed and put the name on. And then the summer, the uh, school board, we went to meetings and they said, well, if you come, you can't talk back. People will probably call you names, but you can't respond and you can't participate in any extracurricular activities only you can only go to school do you still want to go and I think the expectation was we'd say no and some of us said yes you're willing to be uncomfortable in school right and my thought was I'm beautiful I've got a smile to die for I'm talented I'm smart who couldn't love me a couple of weeks it's over and I think maybe all of us felt that how could this be any other way? We're, we can make friends, we will manage this. And then um, the school board uh, published the names of the people they had chosen in the newspaper and that's the night the windows started breaking in my bedroom and the, on Labor Day evening, the governor, Governor Orville Faubus, did a special television appearance saying that he was putting units of the Arkansas National Guard around the school to protect the peace. Well, I don't know the codes. I'm a kid. My parents didn't quite get it. And they asked our parents not to come to school. So eight of us met or assembled there and walked to right just a half block from the school and then walked and were met by the Arkansas National Guard. Now on the other end of the school, Elizabeth Eckford was um, a girl who was mobbed. She, was, she rode the bus to school. And there are some amazing photos of her being tormented by people. And we walked up to the guard and they put their closed ranks for us and then opened back up for white kids and we were pretty bewildered. So we just went home. Bewildered and the Little Rock Nine were thrust into a pivotal time in the American Civil Rights Movement. I could hear the sound of a crowd, it sounded like a sports event. The mob meaning uh, adults on the outside of the school? Yes, yes, as well as some students. And it sounded like a football game or something. And we were taken to these two police cars. One group was told to put blankets over their heads. We were told to keep our heads down. It was in the basement of the school. And uh, one of the main policemen said, when you start driving, do not stop for any reason. And so they screeched out of the side of the school. Um, in the meantime, the mob is beating up this report, these three black reporters who came to do their work. And it's all on film. It's, and they were going to storm the school. So What did it feel like? I mean, did you feel surrounded by hate? I did. I felt... let down because <clears throat> despite the fact that I lived in a segregated society, I, I'd done all these pledges 
that we do, uh, anthems, and actually heard myself say freedom and justice for all. And I go to school one day, and it didn't mean me. And I can't say, I, um, that was how I felt. I felt my heart was really broken. And one of the other uh, nine talks about having a really sheltered, good life. And suddenly, it becomes this other life. Um, so I think for all of us, it was a similar thing that even in a segregated society, there's a level of protection and care. And suddenly, we're in the we're re receiving all this hate, which we had no idea existed. What were people saying to you in, in this mob? Well, it was more, more like a, a roar. It, I don't think there was an individual voice. Um, it was more go back to Africa, um, lots of N words, go home. Um, yeah, but it was, it was a collective roar, I think, uh, that was so frightening. Had it been one person or two people and calling names, I don't think there would have, we would have felt so strongly about it, but it, it was, and I, I talk about it um, turning my head to see the mob, a lot of women. And I was really flat, <laughs> flabbergasted by that. Um, these were women who were apparently trying to protect their own children, white women screaming that I couldn't go to that school. I, and so I'm assuming they were thought they were protecting their children. But at the same time, they were, um, abusing children in the in a very brutal and hateful way the US army would finally take you to school yes um, president eisenhower apparently i would propose that after seeing the reporter beaten felt something had to be done and apparently you know it was the cold war and we're, we're spreading democracy around the world. And I'm a, I've read quite a lot in the Eisenhower papers and about Eisenhower. And, and I would propose that it was the Cold War that uh, caused him to send uh, troops to Little Rock. It was the cause, you know, federal versus state powers. Um, well, what was it like when you did gain entrance to school and you were a student with your, your, your fellow schoolmates? You've been fighting the roar of the angry adult white mob. What about the kids in the school? Well, the uh, 101st Airborne Division uh, dispersed the mob, which meant that it was a lot quieter. And we were surrounded by soldiers and had inside the school each a guard, a personal guard. Um, Did the guard ever say anything to you, saying uh, he, uh, he understands your position or he believes in what you're doing, anything like that? Well, all the guards were white and they were young men. My guard was uh, from Kentucky. And should we actually have a conversation, horror of horrors, white man talking to black girl, oh my God. so. We had to sort of talk very quietly. And what he would do is somebody uh, would spray oil on the floor for, for you to slip. He'd say, move over. Um, people didn't really attack 
so brutally with those guys with us because the first few days they were fixed bayonets. It's my understanding their guns were not loaded, but they were battle dressed. So uh, they calmed it down considerably. Uh, but inside the classrooms, uh, we had to sit in the back. So you'd have to go, either somebody would try to trip you as you go to your back seat. And then you'd get to your seat and it would be um, soiled. It, it would have thumbtacks, it would have spit, uh, could have feces, could have glass, I mean, you're not going to sit there, but you're going to get the message that this chair, which is yours, has been mutilated, and this is where they want you to be. So uh, it, it wasn't physical particularly, but it was really deeply psychological. Um, and people could spit with the guards there, and they could... Um, well, one guard with Melba Patillo, who wrote this book called Warriors Don't Cry, which is about her experience, uh, someone threw acid in her face, and her guard quickly took her to the water fountain and splashed it out of her eyes. Um, and there was no punitive action for all of these insults and... and uh attempts well, to hurt. Well, we realized at first, you know, they would say, well, did anything happen? And then the question would be, did a teacher see it? So the rule was if a teacher didn't see it, it didn't happen. Or, so we stopped telling. We stopped reporting. Um, we didn't dare tell our parents because they wouldn't let us go back. But your dad didn't know how bad it was because you weren't telling him. Well, we couldn't because they would have said, you can't go. And we were going. Um, so we had to protect, we protected our parents uh, from the horror of it because we knew we wanted to keep going. And the drive to keep going was to live on the principles that you were trying to believe in. Yes, the, to force, and I think a lot of the civil rights movement l that came later, and, and in part as a result of these beautiful children who stepped out, uh, was to force these United States to act upon what it always said it was. And I that, guess that, that's what our obligation will always be in this society is to, if you want to use the word force, through nonviolence, a society to live up to its ideals and those uh, words that it tells us it is and those words that it told us, nine kids, that it was. And we knew immediately that it wasn't true but we also felt that we we're going to make it true. And that's, a, that's an interesting sort of way of looking at it. So th that was the condition you were facing in school every day at the time your dad wrote this tele uh, telegraph to the president? Would you read that? Because I would. I haven't he, seen it in a while. Uh, your dad writing to the president of the White House says, we the parents of nine Negro children enrolled at Little Rock Central High School want you to know that your action in safeguarding their rights have strengthened our faith in democracy now as never before. And uh, we have an abiding feeling of belonging and purposefulness. Yeah, I think my dad and other dads, or the, that was a composite letter to um, reinforce Eisenhower's commitment to us because I think that the parents as well as the NAACP felt that without that protection, we would be killed. At the end of the school year, the only 12th grader from the Little Rock Nine, Ernest Green, graduated, an achievement that brought Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to the graduation ceremonies. 
Minnie Jean Brown was not there. The most articulate and forceful of the Little Rock Nine had been expelled. One day, following longtime taunting by a white female student, she called the girl white trash. The school climate became more toxic than ever for her. A group of white male students confronted her in the cafeteria, and she dumped a bowl of chili on her antagonists. Don't ask me what happened. When I got to the vice principal's office, one of the boys who had the most chili was there, and she said, what happened? And did you do it on purpose? And I said, it was accidentally on purpose. And he said, she didn't do anything. Well, they weren't interested in what he said, uh, particularly. And? Um, I was told to go home, and I was suspended. And I can't remember for how long. It was uh, near Christmas holiday. So I don't remember. But when I returned, there was war declared on me. The 101st left in November, and the Arkansas National Guard protected us. Um, but, but the kids were up for war. The kids were ready to pay Minnie Jean back. And so it was just constant kicks, just things, thrown things. Uh, we had, you know, we couldn't leave our books because people would pee in our lockers or they would break them open and rip up our books and just little stuff that just would drive you crazy. But um, so they were really out for me, I think. It's hard to know because we weren't telling each other what was happening. But this group of five girls followed me for about two weeks and my heels were bleeding because they could walk on your heels and nobody could see and they could kick you in assembly. So our legs were all black and blue for the, all of us for the entire time we were there. And I was starting really to get worn down and um, my heels were raw. They'd scab over and then and I was hiding it from my mom because I, I really didn't want her to know. And as they followed me all the way up to my homeroom, calling me names and laughing at my clothes and snickering. And uh, as I'm walking in the homeroom, uh, somebody threw a purse. And I picked it up, opened it, and it had six locks, combination locks in it. Stupid me did not keep it for evidence. And I just dropped it to the floor and said, leave me alone, white trash. Well, guess what? The teacher heard me. But hadn't noticed these did other things? Did not notice the purse, did not see the five girls, did not. And I went down to the girls' vice principal and she sent me home and they said I was gonna be expelled and but we appealed it and did all kinds of things. Now I have to add to that, in 1984, when Elizabeth Huckabee, no relation to Mike Huckabee, was writing her memoir, and a movie was to be made, and she wanted my character, she wanted me to sign a release, and I said, I won't sign a release, because I don't like the way you've portrayed me. You know, I've suffered for being um, maligned for using those two words. And she says, well, Minnie Jean, we expelled you because you were gonna be killed. And I said, yeah, and so I've spent all these years feeling guilty. You never told me, you never told my parents. And I've been disgraced for my whole life for being expelled from Central. But that's kind of off the record and I'm the only person who kind of knows that. And it wasn't just one bold move, one brave day. It was months and months and days and many, many moments and uh, fears and anxieties and, and danger. Yeah, it was. And I understand it much better now. And I'm still working on figuring it out. Um, and I guess it's a good thing because the work I do is about, I'm so compassionate, um, well, but with a sharp tongue. Uh, it is about how we all 
work in this society, how we must come together in some basic way. I didn't choose it. It just uh, came to me to be this person, uh, to believe this way, to work among and with all people in the interest of, you know, well, should we say freedom? Or should we say democracy? All those big words, but should we work together somehow to live in harmony? To this day, Minnie Jean regrets that race-related comment long ago about white trash and explains she just got worn down by the relentless abuse she was dealing with as a teenager. Her place in American history remains intact. When she walked through the doors of Central High, she stepped into a defining moment for the civil rights movement. Her life's work has been to build understanding and to promote freedom and equality. We'll ask her to share more stories on a personal level next week as we continue this long story short conversation with Minnie Jean Brown Tricky. Please join me then. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Did you ever have occasion to talk with one of the white children who was trying to humiliate you? I did, actually. And, um, hmm. Two years ago, I got to talk to um, the person who was the boy who got the most of the chili in the chili incident where I dropped my tray and it splattered. These guys were pushing, um, slamming against me. They were slamming against you in the cafeteria? In the cafeteria and I just dropped the whole thing. He said he wished he had been the kind of person who spoke up, but he was just trying to go to school. And he also said, he didn't get suspended. They told him to go home and change his clothes.